everyone. My name is Elise Shelley. I'm the director of the Master of Landscape Architecture program here at Daniels. Welcome everyone here. It's so great to see many, many people that uh, have been here many years before back with us tonight. First of all, we wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land for the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. And that is what is so exciting about tonight. It's focused on the unique and special attributes of living and working on this land we call Canada. So this book, as you all know, Innate Terrain, edited by Alyssa North, was born out of a symposium of the same name back in 2010. It was a national symposium hosted at Daniels and an exhibition on the exemplary work and ideas of established and emerging Canadian landscape architects. Speakers were invited to present their Canadian projects and to discuss a specific Canadian trajectory. The distinct approach practiced by Canadian landscape architects featured in that symposium has been further elaborated and celebrated in this collection of writings by our alumni, faculty, colleagues, and partners in this field of Canadian landscape architecture. So both the event in 2010 and this book, 12 years later, were generously supported by the Landscape Architecture of Canada Foundation, the Canadian Society of Landscape Architects, the Ontario Association of Landscape Architects, and the Daniels faculty. We're very excited to have so many of the original contributors and supporters here in the audience tonight. We especially appreciate that the CSLA was able to organize their annual visit to the school in a very opportune and timely manner. So while Alyssa will be introducing the authors in her presentation, I have the pleasure of introducing you to Alyssa, who I'm sure needs no introduction. The dedication to the field of landscape architecture in Canada that you see in this publication is evident in all of Alyssa's endeavors, in teaching and in practice. As an associate professor here at Daniels, she plays an essential role in the education of future landscape architects in Canada through her teaching and design studio, visual communications classes, history theory courses, and this is both at the undergraduate and graduate level. She's also a founding partner of North Design Office here in Toronto with a portfolio of Canadian work with international recognition. Through the book, Innate Terrain, we see Alyssa as an advocate and supporter for our profession, and the work and people she has gathered here tonight all exemplify her argument that Canadian landscape architecture is intrinsically linked to the innate qualities of the surrounding terrain. So please join me in welcoming Alyssa North. Um, thank you. Um, so to start, <clears throat> a few words of gratitude. <clears throat> so thank you, Elise, uh, very much. Um, and also to Dean Du. I actually feel very, very supported by both of you. And that's a really productive <laughs> feeling for a faculty member to have. Um, thank you also to all the Daniel staff for pulling together this event. I want to also thanks, uh, send thanks to Charles Waldheim, who helped me get on my academic feet when I was a young professor and who has remained an important mentor. This book grew out of the Innate Train Symposium and Exhibition of 2010, as Elise mentioned, and it was through his understanding of my passion for Canadian landscapes that Charles suggested I make this an academic research focus, which I was very excited to do. As I often say to our students, if Canadians don't write about Canadian landscape architecture, it is unlikely that anyone else will. This book has been a very long journey. With tonight's crowd of predominantly spatial thinkers, I have brought visual proof of the duration, the germination of the book, and of our daughter happened concurrently, and she will soon be 14. I want to provide particular thanks to the LACF, the Landscape Architecture Canada Foundation, who has supported this endeavor with a generous grant 
not to mention supporting the events that led up to it. And for the support from the CSLA and the OILA, among other sponsors, as well as the many contributing students and professionals whose names are outlined in the book's acknowledgements. I'm indebted to the various expertise of everyone at UT Press that made this book a reality. The comments from one of the peer reviewers were particularly constructive, and while I don't know who you are, I want to sincerely thank you for making this book better. Pete, Eileen, and Owen, <laughs> you are my granite rock and my white pines. <laughs> thank you for putting up with this. <laughs> Um, and finally, I want to give incredibly deep thanks to the contributing authors. You've been so generous and patient um, in this endeavor and so intelligent and passionate in sharing your unique perspectives on the Canadian landscape. I'm thrilled to be here in this celebration of our work. With no budget to get you here, I am beyond grateful that most of you have joined in person. I'm also indebted to the late Cornelia Hahn Oberlander, who supported this publication from the start and even initially agreed to write the foreword. Her health did not allow her to see this through, but thankfully, she su suggested esteemed academic and practitioner Ron Williams, who took up the task with such enthusiasm and it was here tonight from Montreal. He is evidently on an Ontario tour with a recent visit to Ottawa where he received the Governor General's Medal in Landscape Architecture. <laughs> um, yeah, so I was gonna ask you to congratulate me, but you already did, so that's amazing. But let's do it again <laughs> as we welcome him to the podium to speak about innate trains forward. Welcome, Ron. Thank you very much, Alyssa, and uh, it's, uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here tonight and to celebrate the publication of this remarkable book with Alyssa and with uh, the remarkable team that uh, um, she assembled, and it, it's also an honor to be uh, second in line behind Cornelia as the, uh, <laughs> as the writer of the foreword. When, when, um, being second to Cornelia is a distinction in itself, so, yeah. Um, I was delighted when Alyssa asked me to write the foreword. And as I started to uh, sketch out my uh, ideas, I remembered some years ago, I read that a foreword should do two things. It should first tell the reader what to expect of the book, and second, situate the new publication in the context of existing literature on the subject. So I tried to do those two things. First, what to expect. Innate Terrain is a broad-ranging exploration of Canadian landscape architecture of the new millennium. This period, beginning in about the year 2000, has been um, characterized by a series of rapid changes uh, changes in both landscape architecture itself and in the uh, context, um, natural context and cultural context in which uh, it has been practiced. Now, um, the traditional definition of what landscape architecture is has always evolved and changed, but um, I think it's fair to say that recent changes in landscape design as an art form have happened more quickly and have been more uh, dramatic than uh, in the past. These changes uh, have, in my view, been essentially positive, often exciting, and sometimes humorous and, and fun. Another set of changes, uh, these in the context of our work, uh, are more ominous. Uh, threats to uh, climate stability, uh, with uh, their far-reaching impact on the landscape, especially uh, in the north. And um, I think a third category of challenges are 
also destabilizing, yet offer the potential for progress, for great progress. The digital revolution, immigration and uh, democratic demographic change, uh, awareness of both the difficulties faced by indigenous peoples and the uh, traditions and traditional knowledge um, that uh, they um, share, uh, and expanding relations on the international scale. Innate terrain takes account of this environment of change. I think it's one of the central elements of the, uh, of the book. The book is composed of a uh, series of in-depth, thoughtful, well-illustrated essays written by 22 authors, sometimes in collaboration, edited by uh, Alyssa, and introduced by her along with Jamie Reeford. In terms of subject matter, each essay explores a uh, particular aspect of contemporary landscape architecture in Canada while contributing to an overall uh, portrait um, that uh, I think we could call a, uh, a mosaic. Now, one way to approach um, the study of any subject uh, in a country like ours with great regional differences is to take a, uh, a regional approach. Um, another is to focus broadly on pan-Canadian issues. And I think, um, wisely, this book has done both. Some chapters explore new design approaches originating in specific regions of the country. Uh, reinterpretations of landscape and building archetypes in Atlantic Canada, um, envelope stretching design innovations from Quebec, the rebirth of Toronto's urban waterfront. Others address the conservation and protection of the natural environment um, or the repurposing of existing works of Canadian landscape architecture. Some essays describe new approaches to the design and management of particular landscapes, um, in including national parks and traditional large uh, urban parks, which themselves are subject to uh, many changing situations. The individual essays often reinforce each other. Sometimes they present contrasting viewpoints and provide multiple perspectives. Um, and I think the differing approaches add up to a uh, rich, and colorful mosaic that is a, a fa um, fascinating depiction of landscape architecture in today's Canada. But um, within this mosaic, I think the book has one central focus, uh, as stated in the introduction. The book's structure and philosophy are based on the conviction that Canadian landscape architecture is intrinsically linked to the innate qualities of the surrounding terrain. Um, as stated in the book, hence the title, Innate Terrain. The powerful influence of landscape uh, and of nature is a common vision of the Canadian reality, and uh, we find uh, that it is um, a basic principle in writings by famous Canadian writers, um, Paintings by famous Canadian painters, Margaret Atwood, Tom Thompson, Jean-Paul Lemieux, Northrop Fry, John Ralston Saul, Louis Aymon, many others. Um, nature imbues their, uh, nature and landscape imbue their uh, works. We see this view of the powerful influence of landscape in many books about architecture that uh, date from the last 30 years. Uh, and, um, and of course, it's uh, a central theme of everything that we do. Alyssa's choice of authors is as broad as the range of subjects discussed. Um, she's put together a multi-generational writing team, uh, including experienced public and private practitioners, mid-career academic practitioners, Indigenous authors, along with established uh, professionals who have worked 
closely with members of First Nations and young graduates who are just now embarking on their careers. Um, the uh, diversity and eclectic range of this group of authors provides a variety of different perspectives and contributes again to the mosaic uh, aspect of the, uh, um, of the book as a whole. And as um, Alyssa has pointed out, the authenticity of the uh, viewpoints of these authors is enhanced by the fact that most are writing about their home environments or places where they are practicing. So um, I think that this uh, variety of uh, provenances of the authors is um, extremely appropriate in a study of uh, current projects and issues. So the jury is still out. Judgments of the future are unknown. And uh, a variety of uh, views are uh, essential. When we ask ourselves how this book relates to the existing literature of landscape architecture and environmental design in Canada, we see that a small number of very thick books have provided um, a broad overview of uh, Canadian architecture and landscape architecture, um, starting with uh, Hal Kalman's two-volume History of Canadian Architecture of 1994. Um, this detailed and thorough study, it had actually been preceded by um, a smaller book, Alan Gowan's Looking at Architecture in Canada in 1959. This was um, a brilliant, even though anecdotal, um, uh, study. The first book about architecture that I read, um, or uh, landscape architecture in Canada or anywhere else, and I recommend it highly. It's hard to find these days. Um, UBC professor uh, Rodri Windsor Liscombe published um, the anthology Architecture in the Canadian Fabric in um, 2012, about uh, 10 years ago. And um, he was, um, he and his colleagues were exploring uh, architecture and urbanism uh, with a kind of a um, kaleidoscopic uh, approach. My own book, Landscape Architecture in Canada, Architecture de Paysage du Canada, 2014, it was meant to provide a similar large-scale overview of the development of our own field, and again, seen from a broad uh, geographical and cultural uh, viewpoint. Uh, and in that book, I emphasized, like the other books I uh, spoke about, the, the importance of the natural landscape of Canada to uh, uh, everything that we do. During the um, last 25 years, quite a number of books have featured the achievements of individual landscape architects and firms based in Canada. So uh, several books have been written about Cornelia Hahn Oberlander, including the excellent book um, by uh, Susan Harrington, um, Phillips uh, Faravag Smallenberg PFS of uh, Vancouver, uh, have, their work has been explored in a, a, an excellent book. And again, uh, Susan Harrington worked with uh, Mark Tribe from Berkeley to uh, uh, create a, a fascinating and fun book about the work of uh, Claude Carmier, a associé of Montreal. Um, but uh, few books have been published on the 19th and early 20th century founders of landscape architecture in Canada uh, in marked contrast to what's happened south of the border where there's probably 500 books on Olmsted alone. Uh, um, only a handful of books have uh, focused on the evolution of landscape architecture at the provincial or regional scale. A splendid exception is uh, Catherine McDonald's CD-ROM, which is called Making a Place, a History of Landscape Architecture and Landscape Architects in Manitoba, uh, sponsored by um, MALA, the uh, Manitoba Association of Landscape Architects, in 2005. Um, you can see a, an inside page also here. Um, and then uh, some, some years earlier, Cornelia wrote an excellent uh, chapter in The New Spirit, which was a study of modernism in, uh, uh, in Vancouver. The um, profession grew 
um, during these, um, these years of uh, modern and contemporary landscape architecture from a tiny handful of dedicated pioneers, as we see here in a 1940s meeting of the uh, annual meeting of the CSLA, into a um, well-organized and numerous body of practitioners, as shown in this photo uh, at their 50th year anniversary conference yet held in Ottawa in 1984. Um, other major developments happened during this period, um, university level uh, educational programs, provincial and regional associations. All these achievements led to the, emerg the emergence of Canadian landscape architecture as we, uh, uh, as we know it today. One might think that the uh, modern and contemporary developments would have been uh, mirrored by um, literary productions, but that hasn't been the case. It has been the case for modern architecture in Canada, but um, there's only a few very, um, uh, oops, excuse me, a few um, unique and um, relatively unknown um, examples, including um, a um, volume uh, which was put together by uh, Cecilia Payne of uh, Guelph University that describes the, uh, or that um, includes in both uh, English and French all of the discussions at the 50th anniversary meeting in uh, Ottawa. And it's absolutely fabulous, but um, there's not a lot of copies around. Uh, in uh, Quebec, the uh, magazine Continuité published a similar, although uh, um, a smaller um, compendium of the uh, AAPQ's work uh, in 1990. That was our 30th uh, anniversary. Unfortunately, no um, comprehensive book length volume has been published in Canada on this subject until now. Et voila. Um, and and I think that's one of the reasons why this book is so uh, important. It's um, important, it's timely, it goes a long way to filling the uh, modern contemporary literary gap, particularly the last quarter century. It provides the profession with a well-illustrated, multi-dimensional view of what's going on today. And it's a, a welcome addition to the growing literature on Canadian landscape architecture, and it will provide all of us with uh, a valuable means of uh, understanding our own rapidly evolving field. So thank you very much, and congratulations. Thank you, Ron. I was um, so overwhelmed when he made complete sense of what this book was for me. So. <laughs> um, there's a lot of clarity in that. Um, so I'm going to cover the introduction chapter, and then um, Jamie's going to join in by Zoom through the miracles of our Daniels team here, uh, and then um, we'll move on to the chapter authors in really quick succession. Um, so in terms of um, the introduction chapter, uh, the imaginary of the Canadian landscape is often tied with wilderness. In crafting our introduction, we noticed that works of Canadian landscape architecture are particularly influenced by their context and their pre-urban conditions, referencing or rebuilding the prevailing ecosystems of Canada's innate terrain. Part of our basis is that as one of the countries holding the majority of remaining wilderness while also being one of the least populated, Canada and Canadians have closer ties to the land as the innate landscape is quite directly legible. The reconstituted granite rock monoliths of Toronto's York Yorkville Park and Sugar Beach, the Taiga Garden at the National Gallery of Canada in Ottawa with pines installed at an angle to give a windswept appearance. 
the timber structures and walks and impressive granite blocks of Quebec City's promenade Samuel de Champlain aligned to promote regeneration of the pre-colonial shoreline and upland ecologies. Or the green systems of the Vancouver Convention Center and landscape, which conveyed the geological forces of mountains with a massive green roof suggesting an alpine ecology. These are all Canadian projects designed by Canadian landscape architects, powerfully evoking nature or performing naturally or doing both. The chapter authors have used these and other works of landscape architecture to theorize a particular approach practiced by Canadian landscape architects in their national context. <clears throat> not COVID. <laughs> While the position of Canada's landscape architects on the wilderness gradient continues to provoke debate, and in relation to our paths towards reconciliation, the book addresses these varied perceptions of Canada's landscapes on which Jamie will elaborate. Where did Ali go? There, yay. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Jamie Reeford, and I co-authored this introductory chapter with Alyssa. Since time immemorial, humanity has been shaped by the landscapes within which we have resided. Beyond fulfilling the basic requirements for human survival, habitable landscapes have spurred the rise of civilizations and cultures, with each characterized to some degree by a dependency on and a connection to their physical surroundings. These ancient links between survival, culture, and landscape were foundational, uh, catalyzing invention, fostering systems of governance, and nurturing complex spiritual interpretations. However, through centuries of cultural evolution and cross-pollination, Contemporary Western civilizations share a unifying characteristic, and that is that they all have eschewed their regional roots in favor of a more generalized social contract built upon political order. The mounting pressures of densification throughout Europe during the modern colonial era coincide with this transformation. This was also a major factor driving the colonial conquest of the new world, as it was then known. The original inhabitants of the land that now falls within the national borders of Canada rejected the notion of nature brought to heel, instead living within interpretations of a social contract derived from balance with and respect for the land. The inherent tensions and the resulting conflicts created by the juxtaposition of Indigenous and Western cultures in Canada is addressed at length by many of the chapter authors in this book. Altered by the numerous external influences that define this country, many of the underlying factors specific to humanity's original relationship with the, Canadian, with the landscapes of Canada have remained intact, but also compromised. The historical and cultural context underlying Canadian landscape design also, also shares close conceptual connections with how we define nature, as well as our place within it. Landscape theorizing about nature and design has traditionally established a binary relationship between the two subjects, consciously separating or prioritizing built form over the natural environment. Contemporary landscape architecture academics are beginning to work towards the dissolution of these binaries as outmoded vestiges of early philosophical thinking. Again, uh, many of the authors that you will hear from this evening are on the front lines of this important shift in thinking. Ultimately, we are confronted with two opposing narratives, domination over landscape versus an, intern, versus an intentional accord with landscape. The vastness and varied nature of the Canadian territory and the diversity of peoples within it create a uniquely primed canvas for this ongoing debate. With the publication of this book, Alyssa North and the contributing authors have provided critical context to help us make sense of it all. Thanks. Good to see you. I, I gave him the really hard parts of the chapter. Um, as a whole, the book's various chapters invoke recurrent themes involving the qualities and importance of nature in Canada, each imbued with national and local sensitivities. Several authors share their ideas and ideals about indigenous traditional knowledge, revealing some of the earliest human interactions with nature in this country. 
Um, most authors have drawn connections between Canada's landscapes and the unique cultures it engendered, including the idiosyncrasies of urban dwellers and the inhabitants of larger rural regions. Compiled and cross-referenced, the volume aims to provide further provocation about the identity of Canadian landscape architecture. The work of Canadian landscape architects on their home ground demonstrates sensitivity, practical problem solving, and environmental consciousness. While we continue to globalize, landscape appears to be the one enduring element that will keep our regions as distinct as communicated through intact ecology, geology, climate, and equitable human habitation, factors that will ultimately sustain planetary health. The book intends to demonstrate that Canadian landscape architects will continue to make consequential contributions as based on the central argument that the work is intrinsically linked to the innate qualities of the surrounding terrain. And I would now like to pass the presentation over to the chapter authors to share their perspectives with James Thomas joining us online from Quebec, whose slides I'll help advance. Welcome, Jim. Hello, everybody. Give me a thumbs up or let me know if you can't hear me properly. Um, yeah, it's uh, James Thomas. I'm actually joining you from Winnipeg, Manitoba. Um, unfortunately, I can't be with you this evening in person, but I'm grateful to be able to join you via Zoom. Uh, I'm a senior advisor and former principal with HTFC Planning and Design, a firm of landscape architects and planners based in Winnipeg and Saskatoon. That, uh, in 2020, celebrated 50 years of practice uh, in Canada. Quite a, an astounding achievement. I'd, I'd like to thank Elise for opening the proceedings with a land acknowledgement. Uh, but before I continue, I would like to acknowledge I'm speaking to you from the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe, Inanu, Oji Cree, and Dakota peoples, and the homeland of the Red River Metis. I'm currently in Treaty 1 territory and will be speaking about Treaties 1, 2, and 3. Uh, you will appreciate the importance of this personal acknowledgement as I talk about my chapter in the book and, and when you read the chapter. The chapter is called Resolve. It is about some of HTFC's experience working with First Nations on the negotiation and implementation of land claims, with three claims as examples. The Rainy River First Nations 1914-15 surrender claim, the Pegwas Treaty Land Entitlement claim, and the St. Peter's 1907 surrender claim. I can't give you a lot of detail about those claims, but I, uh, they are summarized, the history of them, summaries in the book. So thank you for bringing up the first slide. This, this map uh, indicates and shows the treaties, modern and historic, that cover Canada. When HTFC began our work on the Rainy River First Nations claim in 1993, land acknowledgements at events such as this did not occur. Indeed, most Canadians, our governments, institutions and businesses had little, if any, awareness or understanding of Indigenous peoples and Indigenous landscapes. It's good to see that that appears to be changing. As shown on this map, the vast majority of the lands and waters within the area known as Canada are covered by one or more treaties or agreements with Indigenous peoples. The remaining areas are affected by unsettled treaties or agreements and unresolved claims. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada said, it is important for all Canadians to understand that without treaties, Canada would have no legitimacy as a nation. Treaties between Indigenous nations and the Crown establish the legal and constitutional foundation of this country. Next slide, please. This slide is showing a map of the area of treaties one, two, and three. You can see Winnipeg there and some of the reserve lands of the Peguis First Nation and the Rainy River First Nations. The claims discussed in the chapter relate to reserve land, the illegal taking of reserves by Canada and the failure of Canada to set aside land according to treaty. It's important to recognize reserves are only one of the rights, interests, benefits, and obligations set out in treaties one and three. Reserves are also not the entirety of First Nation land. The First Nations continue to have and hold legal rights and interests throughout the treaty areas and their traditional territories. Again, that's explained to some extent in the chapter. Next slide, please. My chapter presents work on the periphery of traditional landscape architectural practice, to be polite. It shows how the knowledge and skills of landscape architects and planners can contribute to the resolution of land claims. In May 2005, 90 years after the purported surrender of their reserves and following more than a decade of negotiations and consultation, 
The Rady River First Nations, Ontario and Canada signed an agreement to settle the surrender claim. Representatives from HTFC attended the celebration. It was a great day. Next slide, please. The Pegwas TLE claim and the St. Peter's surrender claim were settled a few years later in 2008 and 2010, after more than a decade of negotiations, analysis, and consultations. Again, the HTFC was very happy to be invited to participate. The claim settlements have their limitations and do not address all issues surrounding the claims, and they certainly do not resolve challenges facing the First Nation. But the settlements are significant steps toward fulfilling treaty obligations and addressing long-standing grievances. In the words of James Enea, former United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, full respect for treaties, agreements, and other constructive arrangements is a crucial step in advancing toward reconciliation with Indigenous peoples and addressing persistent, deep-rooted problems related to historical wrongs, failed policies of the past, and continuing barriers to the full realization of Indigenous peoples' rights. In closing, I would like to express my gratitude to the elders, councils, staff and members of the Rainy River First Nations and Peguas First Nation for the privilege of working with them for so many years. I'd also like to acknowledge and thank my colleagues at HDFC Planning and Design for their diligence and excellence, and to Rod McLeod, Leo Weisberg, David Rannard, and the many other advisors and experts with whom we collaborated over the years. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. Nice to see you. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'll now call up Grant Fulgren for the in-person chapter introduction. Hello, my name is Grant Fulgren. I'm a member of Wabagoon Lake Ojibwe Nation, which is uh, in Northern Ontario. I'm also the chair of the Canadian Society of Landscape Architects Reconciliation Advisory Committee and currently I'm a Frank Knox Fellow and Fulbright Scholar at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. And the chapter I'm presenting is called Collaboration with Keepers of Traditional Knowledge. The chapter I wrote uh, challenges the notion of traditions being fixed in a distant past. I'm convinced that the lessons that have been learned over thousands of years of inhabitation by indigenous peoples are critical to call upon today as we confront climate change and seek to walk the path of reconciliation. What I focus on are three sites where traditional knowledge has or could inform landscape, architecture, and infrastructural systems. The Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh that call what is now known as Greater Vancouver home have lived there for many thousands of years, such a long period of time that much of the lands that the Greater Vancouver area is now situated on formed over that time as glaciers receded about 10,000 years ago and sediment traveled down the Fraser River forming areas of Richmond, Surrey, and Delta. Today, sea level rise threatens much of these areas. Luckily, salt marshes, which you can see on sort of the left-hand side in this brighter green, protect some of those areas from storm surges. These environments are also under threat, though, as the rate of sea level rise has the potential to outpace their ability to adapt. Coast Salish peoples have a deep understanding of these ecosystems and the subtle relationship between tidal fluctuations and plant species that thrive in narrow tidal ranges. So, on these platforms here, which is a traditional practice of the Coast Salish, they understood so clearly where plants could thrive, and they would build small walls that a section of plant that did really well in a very narrow area of that tidal range could thrive. And so they were able to expand it, and they used this to produce food, uh, such as carbohydrates, that would supplement their largely salmon-based diet. And so the proposal I had was to take this form of traditional knowledge and think in a contemporary sense, how could we translate this and actually increase the amount of sediment that we capture through how these, are, these forms could be arranged to increase sediment so that it keeps up with the rate of sea level rise. And so these are just some of the ways of thinking about ecological systems where we can take what has been something that has been learned and, and taught across countless generations, something that we can apply today to the challenges that we face, and also allow for the practice of that knowledge in a contemporary sense. So the second project is much closer by, and it's the Right Honorable Herb Gray Parkway. This project uh, completed, I think, in 20, the early 2010s, uh, was intended to restore a lot of the tall grass prairie, which has been lost through agricultural development uh, in southern Ontario here. So the greater extent of tall grass prairie is the lighter green, 
and what remained was the darker green, which only existed on Walpole Island, right at the border between the US and Canada. The only reason it could exist is because the Walpole Island members would burn their tall grass prairie periodically, countervening uh, orders from the federal government to stop that practice. But when the Ministry of Transport had to look for seed remnant ecology in order to reestablish tall grass prairie, it was the only place that they could go to to find the right type of seed stock that would replenish it. And so they worked with Walpole Island and they, they developed uh, a way to integrate that through the development of this project and expanded uh, back large portions of that tall grass prairie. But we still meet some of these challenges where even though that's where they could take the knowledge from, the ongoing maintenance of that is overseen by a company rather than by the community itself. And so there isn't that potential to continue to practice and learn from this knowledge as we go through climate change. The final one is in uh, Northern Quebec where uh, hydrologic development has really reshaped the landscape there dramatically. An area the size of Switzerland uh, was flooded in order to create some of the hydropower that feeds the urban areas uh, further south. And that was all on Cree lands. Um, without consultation, uh, in a lot of cases, uh, these projects were developed and without really thinking about traditional knowledge and traditional use sites. So when one of these dams was completed uh, and fall came, they started holding back the water in order to power uh, the cities in the winter and allow the water to release later when we need heat. Uh, and what that did was flooded a valley where caribou were migrating through. And a, several thousand caribou were flooded there and, and lost entirely. And so from that event, they reestablished a relationship with the Northern Cree and uh, went uh, under agreement called the Pays de Bras. And from that, they were able to have this relationship where they could learn from traditional knowledge keepers in these areas. And so when new dams were established, what the knowledge keepers told those that were operating this infrastructure was that they actually needed to keep a base flow in the fall before the winter when they'd want to hold all the water back in order to keep the, the, the river flowing and that the ice wouldn't set up too early because that would trap uh, migrating fish that were heading out to the bay. And so by just that simple attunement of thinking about the timing and the place in which it's situ situated, it reconfigures this infrastructural systems we think is very mechanistic as being something more integrated with the environment. We can think of many more ways that this could be pushed uh, forward. And so those are just three examples of the forms of traditional knowledge that exist across Canada. But there's a much, a plethora of knowledge that is out there in all of these traditional territories. And each one of these First Nations understand really intimately the area that they're located and have the potential to aggregate those at scale in the form of watersheds and across vast territories that these small sort of impacts can be uh, much bigger and has the potential to inform how we practice landscape architecture and the way we think about ecology and infrastructural systems. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Adrian Sunhall. I am a uh, former landscape architect, um, visual artist and curator, and uh, in my day-to-day, -to -day, today I am the studio manager for the visual artist Kent Monkman. Um, so my chapter uh, to this amazing book is entitled Nouveau Paysage, Contemporary Installations by Canadian Landscape Architects. And uh, I will say that I wrote this chapter in, I think, uh, 2016. So I wish I had some more contemporary examples, so don't, uh, don't blame me for that. Um, in this chapter, I am interested in examining the emergence of temporary installations by Canadian landscape architects as a mode of work that critically explores Canadian cultural identities related to landscape. There's been an increasing number of installations uh, by landscape architects in the last 30 years whether that be at garden festivals, at art-specific events, and in everyday urban contexts. Installations are most often temporary, but they're directly tied to the long history of garden design and also have a relationship to visual art. Despite a rich history of association between the garden and romance, philosophy, and artistic expression, Landscape was largely left out of the dialogue of and practice of art institutions for most of the 20th century. Um, and in my view, installations by landscape architects have become really integral to the revival of landscape as an artistic medium. 
The chapter begins with a brief history detailing the relationship between uh, landscape and art, the history of the garden as a subject of aesthetic exploration, and the recent emergence of installation projects. So it ex then examines a number of installation projects through three predominant themes that I've identified that reflect uh, progression of Canada's cultural landscape identities, which are uh, wilderness myths, nature and artifice, and shifting landscapes. So wilderness myths, as Alyssa and Jamie touched on uh, in the introduction, um, have really been central to the cultural identity and cultural imagination of Canada's landscapes. There is a myth of Canada as a vast, untouched, and completely uninhabited wilderness. Uh, you know, despite the majority of our populations now living in urban areas, and you know, for decades this has been reinforced by paintings um, by artists such as the Group of Seven, which created a visual identity in the cultural imagination of Canada that continues to influence what Canadian is today. Um, so this is an interesting project um, that I think kind of explores the idea of the sublime in wilderness, um, which is a project by Sarah, Rosetta Sarah Elkin, uh, titled Tiny Taxonomy from the Jardin de Métis in 2010. It really celebrates the inherent beauty of wild plants and places tiny native ground cover species of the forest floor on reflective pedestals at, brought up to an eye level. The pedestal is reminiscent of a Victorian way of catalog and display of species. Alongside this idea of the sublime, equally influential has been the idea of the frontier, which is heavily rooted in the resource-oriented perspectives of European settlers for whom the wilderness was a source of fear and mystery to be tamed, extracted, and profited from. So this is a piece by uh, Tom Thompson called The Drive. Um, and this work, which I just absolutely love, is called Floating Forest by uh, NIP Paysage, um, which was created for 2012 for Chelsea's Fringe Festival. There are concentric rows in a rectilinear pattern of um, an old growth. Uh, I believe it's a white pine. Um, and what this project does is it really connects the history of logging in Canada's boreal forest. Um, you think of images of floating log runs, um, to the export and trade in a former industrial area of London. Um, and this is interesting because in the buildings in this area, the large timbers that were used in these 19th century buildings were at the time most likely to have come from eastern white pine, logged in Quebec's boreal forest, taken from the Saint, through the St. Lawrence. The second theme of nature and artifice questions the paradox of wilderness. This idea that nature, to be natural, must be pristine and completely untouched by the human hand. And explores the dichotomy between natural and man-made, which persists in popular thinking today. This is what allows us to privilege some landscapes while devaluing others. For example, the contrast between you know, protected national parks versus uh, suburban wetlands. So landscape architects have really been central to understanding landscape as constructed and challenging this dichotomy. So this is a great example um, by Alyssa and <laughs> Pete um, nor as North Design Office uh, titled Core Sample, also at the Jardin de Miti, which really makes the scientific and technological methods of understanding landscape visible through geotechnical core samples, um, drawing attention to the unseen subterranean landscape. And this, which I'll end with, is, is one of my favorite projects uh, by Claude Cormier and Associé titled Lipstick Forest. It is from 1999 uh, when the studio was commissioned to create a winter garden in the Palais de Congrès in Montreal. The project uh, references grand hundred-year-old maples that line Montreal's avenues, uh, which are absolutely iconic, which you can see in the picture at the top, and the success of Montreal's cosmetics industry. The density of the concrete trunks create the feeling of a forest grove um, and draw on the collective memory of an iconic landscape. In conclusion, uh, despite a relatively young ornamental garden tradition in Canada, and I would say our over-reliance on European influences, a unique landscape identity is emerging. 
the popularity of installation and art-based approaches has spread from these temporary works to more permanent public spaces like Sugar Beach and June Callwood Park in Toronto. Installations by landscape architects have been integral to formulating an understanding of a contemporary identity, creatively reflecting on the collective memory and imagination of this land. The ephemeral and ad hoc nature of installations has proven critical to the profession of landscape architecture, offering a venue for artistic exploration and self-reflective criticality. And uh, I'll just finish by one of my favorite quotes by Claude, which is that the garden is about experience, not plants. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Chris Grosset, uh, Unasakut. Uh, I am the uh, principal of Envision Insight. Uh, which is an architecture firm, a landscape architecture, a multidiscipline firm based in Ottawa in Iqaluit. I co-authored this um, with Marla Limousine, who is currently the executive director of the Nunavut Association of Municipalities. But truth be told, this is really a uh, 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 chapter authored by the Inuit elders and hunters that really have been our advisors of our, our 25 year career. Uh, it is their knowledge and information shared through their oral traditions that we write down in our plans, in our designs, and in our chapters uh, for this book. And I actually want to just say that I, was, I spoke at the initial Innate Terrain Symposium, um, so I think I was an emerging professional then. I think I've skipped right over to being maybe a senior practitioner at this point by the time the book has come out. Uh, but I really want to thank Alyssa for inviting me back because I was the first speaker after the keynote at the original session, and I don't remember what the gentleman said, but it really jarred me uh, and my perspective and what I was starting to understand from Inuit about the landscape. So I, instead of staying to the script, I said something about something that he said being akin to a specific farm animal's uh, manure. So um, anyway, listen, let me come back, and I think that really what happens here is that this chapter is an ability for us to say that the innate terrain as we as landscape architects who work with, uh, in, in my case, Inuit in Inuit Nunukat and, and specifically Nunavut, is our, our mission really is not to impose our design and approach on the landscape of Inuit, but it's actually to be transformed by the knowledge base that Inuit uh, can share with us and how they view their world. And one of the things that uh, you know, Grant and myself and Jim, are, we're part of a continuum of, of saying, how do we adapt and draw in knowledge systems from indigenous people into the practice of landscape architecture? And that's what this chapter explores through the, uh, a, a number of Inuit uh, principles uh, called Inuit Kayomaitakangi, which will be share are shared with you in this chapter. And what it does, uh, this chapter, is really explores a few ways that this knowledge system, if you are able to uh, bring it into your practice, uh, can either alter the design or change the process. And, in, and ideally, what we've learned, in, even since I wrote this chapter seven years ago, uh, is that we've applied it in so many amazing projects. A second book is needed, I think, Alyssa. And so we you know, have learned how to take this uh, into the bridging between um, Inuit Kayomaitakangi and uh, the practice of landscape architecture. What is important in this is that we, I sometimes hear the term braiding, as if our, our role is to somehow bring Inuit Kayomaitakangi and our practice as landscape architectures together and sort of interweave them. And what I've actually learned through the process and what we talk about in this um, this uh, chapter is that really, no, it must be much more about the co-design and the co-planning approach where Inuit are driving the process. So anyone who's sat through one of my lectures or my talks in the past will know that I always talk about context, awareness, understanding. And only after you've gone through and you've put the effort into context, understanding, and awareness should you think about moving towards the action item, which is either the design or the outcome. And this is uh, Makita, Mr. well, Mr. Bruce. I only ever knew him as Mr. Bruce. Um, he was a teacher of mine 
for many years, Marla and I, and um, uh, Mikituk, uh, was really instrumental in changing our way of viewing the work that we do as landscape architects in the context of Inuit land. Because he said to us, you need to see the landscape through Inuit eyes. And he repeated that again and again, and he showed us and demonstrated it to us in his teachings and his practice. And then this chapter demonstrates that it really is possible to do that in your landscape architecture work. This is not a how-to process that's in this chapter. It's a way to think. It's a way that you need to transform yourself. So I hope you enjoy it. Good evening. Um, my name is Stéphane Leblanc. I'm an architect. I'm practicing in Toronto. Uh, I also happen to be married with one of our co-authors who's a landscape architect. So that's where I get immersed into this beautiful discipline and, and culture. And, and that's not me. It's Andrea. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Um, my name is Matthew Brown. Uh, I'm the co-founder and principal of Brackish Design Studio, which is probably based in Atlantic uh, Canada. And a little sidebar is actually when I started writing this in Boston, um, it was actually through working with Andrea that she reconnected me to Sandra Cook that encouraged me to move back to Atlantic Canada. And a few years later, we started Brackish. So there's a lot more beneath the words that uh, happen, which I'm very uh, grateful for. Um, for our chapter, there was four authors, uh, Andrea, Stefan, myself, and James, who's not here. And we all have roots uh, in Atlantic Canada, which is our home region. But we were all living outside of the region, and you kind of gain a certain appreciation for home when you're away. And Atlantic Canada is such a unique place, so rich in history, in culture, in building techniques, in materials. And that's something that we always felt should be celebrated. And when we were trying to find contemporary projects, um, first we started trying to think, and all of a sudden you go right to the critical of what we were seeing, which is more of an acultural model of development, you know, lacking of any sense of place and more generic. Um, and that's where we started to really put our brains together to try to highlight and figure out projects that had a much deeper understanding of what it was uh, to be local. So our chapter starts with a brief history of uh, Atlantic Canada and our region to help you understand where, uh, where we're coming from, and I'll let you read that. I won't go through all of that. Um, but I'm going to let Stefan tell you about some of the projects within the chapter that really start to look deeper into why we are, have a unique uh, way of doing things and how some of that is exemplified in these projects. So for, for us, um, the local, as we were going through this and talking back and forth, we all came with different projects that we wanted to discuss and we were interested in and, and with different ideas and as we were collaborating with this, the idea of local and the strengths of local kind of start to have different meanings. And through the different projects uh, uh, that we talk about, we discuss a little bit what some of those different uh, strengths are and how local can be considered, whether it's in this case with the uh, Greenwich Dunes and the Greenwich Day Facility, a project by BDA Landscape Architects, whether it's about building in a way or creating a space that can protect a beautiful, uh, important natural feature. Um, same thing in another project that we discussed with is, uh, the uh, Irving Eco Center in Bactouche, uh, a similar idea also by BDA Landscape Architects. Or whether it's about here, as in Fogo Island, using cultural resources, the co local communities, and local uh, knowledge to build a space that is about enhancing and, and creating new local culture. Um, and, and, you know, we, there are so many, we've talked about a few projects, we only have five minutes, so I can only, you know, like to talk about this one in particular a little longer. This is one that's called the Uncertain Center of the Mary Celeste. It's a project in Spencer Island, Nova Scotia. Uh, it was built and created by students of the Dalhousie School of Architecture with Professor Roger Mullen. Um, it's the projects are part of a, a program with the School of Architecture in Halifax called Free Labs. Every summer, the students get together 
uh, as teams. They decide, and, you know, they do a design build project, they decide what they want to do, they design the project themselves, and then they build it. It's a hands-on experience for them. Many of these projects are temporary, they disappear after a few months, but a few of them happen to come back to the same spot every year and build on the previous year. And this is one of those cases. And it's happening in, this one is in Spencer Island, which is a community, uh, a small town in Nova Scotia that was once a major shipbuilding center. In the age of sail, this community used to build quite a few you know, large sailing ships. And the Mary Celeste is one of those ships. It was, it was birthed in, sport, in, in, uh, in Spencer's Island as the Amazon. It, it plied the seas for many years and you know, changed ownership and became named the Mary Celeste. And eventually was found floating off the coast of Portugal. The crew had gone, the ship was intact, one lifeboat was gone, but everything else was you know, perfectly okay. And there was no evidence as to what had happened to the crew. So, through the years, the speculation of what happened kind of became, you know, story and myth and eventually became a short story by Arthur Conan Doyle and is part of the local folklore of, of, of Port Spencer. This is where the, you know, the, this, this ship came from. So the, in this case with Roger Mullen and the students, they, they decided to start creating a, a center or a place building small structures every year uh, that they would design, they would come up with the program and, and, and start to create uh, a commemorative space for the Mary Celeste. Uh, you know, what you see here, a tower that is actually resembles a bridge ship, but it's actually a projection booth. Uh, there is a two masts that hold up a sailcloth that can become the screen. And every year, the students come in, they start fresh, and they, they, they decide what they're going to do. Sometimes they take away parts of the old project, sometimes they build on something that's there. There are markings in the ground there. There is a, a long field stone wall that, that mimics the shape of a prow. So, not, and so this is a commemorative space that is not exactly literal. It's, it's meant to evoke the, the spirit of this ghost ship. And in a way, this project, which is built with local materials, is built with, with help from local resources. It's built from the same white pine and spruce timber that's milled locally that was used for the ships back in the, 18th, or the 19th century. And um, the thing that interested us with this is it's, it, it kind of takes, a, it's a commemorative space, but it takes a sort of different approach. It's not from the tradition of written and recorded history where facts and truths are important. This project was more about myth building and storytelling, where story, oral storytelling, when, when the story takes on a life of its own as it's repeated from generations to generations, and where the myth becomes built from that, where truth is no longer really necessarily the important thing, but the idea is the, you know, the, 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 the folklore, the legend, and the myth can become important, the same way that the story of the Mary Celeste became myth. And that, to us, we thought was quite important, because in the, in the Atlantic provinces, oral storytelling and myth building is a very important tradition. So for us, it's not only, in this case, not only the materials that are local, it's not only the the labor that is local, it's also the, the tradition and the strategy of, of myth making and, and oral storytelling, we thought. And so this project, and even the fact that it's, it's constantly shifting, which every year as students come in and build a little bit more, take away pieces, and, and have different meanings as to what this center needs to be, it also has a sense of impermanence. We don't know how long this is going to last. Um, so that, you know, as an as example, a bit of an unusual example of how local is, you know, carry through, but it was one that for us seemed quite important. And um, again, we've got you know, other projects. This is Culture of Art Upports, um, my ERA architects with students from the Toronto Metropolitan University in Nova Scotia. Uh, again, it's a similar idea of building locally with local traditions and, and, and finding w ways to mark on the ground. And uh, last image um, I'll leave you with is this other project from Acre Architects in St. John, New Brunswick. Um, it's, it's a slightly different strategy of local. This is in, in New Brunswick, which is a province that's called the uh, drive-through province, because most people drive from Quebec to Nova Scotia and cut through the center of the province, missing most of the important parts of the province, and could be come out with the idea that you know New Brunswick is all about evergreens and, and highway signs. So Acre Architects, in this case, where they were they were hired to do a public art feature to to hide one of those generic and atypical construction pieces that we were talking about where um, a beautiful hill was, was landscaped over to create a civic building with a, 
a precast concrete retaining wall, this art project takes that roadway sign, the highway sign, takes the, it's a relatively inexpensive material, sli gets slivers into it to create this beautiful, uh, colorful, impactful uh, art piece. And you know, then you know, it folded the materials where there's a bus stop so that you could actually create a seat with it. And, uh, and kind of has a sense of irony and wit that is, again is another one of those elements of, of local maritime tradition that, um, you know, that there, there's storytelling is important and there's a certain amount of weight, wit and uh, make-do attitude that, that this one, we thought this project kind of carried through. Um, so that, in, in a sense, is, is what we thought, you know, the local for us meant many different things. It was a way for, you know, in, a, in an area of the, the, of, of the country that doesn't see, uh, that has a lot of richness but doesn't always see that developed in this project. We thought this, this insistence on trying to find projects that kind of use that, the nature of local, the local resources, but also the culture were important projects to kind of highlight. Hello, everyone. Next slide. Um, what's that? Oh, the clicker. This. OK. Thank you. All right. Um, hello. Um, I'm Marc Halle with uh, CCXA, formerly Claude Cormier Associé. Yannick Raberge from uh, CCXA as well, associate with Marc and uh, two other people at the office. And um, we were invited and we're really kind of humbled by the company that we're keeping in this book and really appreciate being invited to contribute a kind of a perspective from Quebec. And uh, I didn't grow up in Quebec, I grew up in Saskatchewan. Yannick is from Quebec, so it's kind of two views. I'm kind of outside the forest and uh, Yannick is inside the trees. So it's kind of two perspectives trying to meet in the middle. And the title of this is uh, L'Anarchie Resplendissante, Resplendent Anarchy Towards a Quebec Regionalism. And uh, just trying to understand what makes design, culture, landscape architecture different in Quebec. There's kind of a different story. And I think we hear a lot from maybe in Canada, nature is a very strong motif. But in, in Quebec, I would say a lot of it is social and political. Mm -hmm. And I think this is kind of a, this is a, a photograph that was taken during the, uh, the student protests under the pink balls on St. Catherine. And it kind of, we figure it kind of captures the irreverence that is at the bottom of, of kind of this approach to designing Quebec. And it's just interesting because the gay village in Montreal, which is this, this is where it's located, 50 years before had been kicked out, evacuated by police raids from the west side of the city during Expo 67 and the Olympics to kind of sanitize the city. But you can see this reversal of power where Giselle Lullaby is the one saying no to the police instead of the police telling Giselle Lullaby to leave. Not in my neighborhood, you're not welcome here. And I think this kind of reflects a larger move. And it all starts from the Quiet Revolution. And an interesting kind of spark that started was in the early 1940s by a group of artists, 14, called Les Automatistes, led by Jean-Paul Paul Emile Baudouin, which is the painting up there. And you can recognize the Perimeter Institute just below by Sassien Perrat. And there's an interesting kind of important um, consequence of the Reflux Global. And it were, they were surrealists. Les Automatistes was their name, inspired by the surrealists. And I think what was important was they were outside language. They didn't use the language that was oppressing the French majority in Quebec. They were using art, abstraction, to kind of break through in an iconoclastic fashion to develop a new structure. And as soon as it was published, Paul Emile Baudois was kind of self-imposed exile to France. He had lost his job. The others in the group were, were banished. But now they're kind of celebrated as the the voice of modern Quebec. And the, and, the, and the generation that kind of followed this reversal in the power dynamic where the French majority became the power keepers of Quebec, they didn't want to go back to the kind of Catholic repressive religious roots that identified their culture. This was a time to invent a new expression for this new reality. And I'd say there's a generation that came in the 60s and the 70s. Sassine Perrat, I would say, is an example. Claude Cormier is an example. Generations of, of artists, really important, scrappy, fierce, intelligent um, trailblazers. And, and, they, and they really kind of created a, a new cultural expression, which, if, if anything else, is irreverent, disacré, iconoclastic, breaking something old to create something new. 
And I think this is something that uh, design brings, is this, this kind of ferocity and this kind of a duality, this from the previous era, this religious monasticism, but a decadent monast monasticism or a sensual austerity, like this zipper dress by um, Denis Gagnon. It kind of invites uh, sensuality, an invitation, but it's also an armor, which allows, is in, impenetrable. There's this kind of duality in this, in this dichotomy. And I just maybe want to just quickly kind of maybe read to you some translations from this manifesto, the Reflux Global, to kind of give it context, to kind of pre-context pre, pre for what uh, Yannick's going to present and how this is expressed in the project. The present will inevitably give way to the future. We need not worry about the future until we happen upon it. Um, we passed beyond Christianity to touch the burning brotherhood of man to which religion had barred the door. And this is one that I think is quite strong. Our minds were energized by the poet Mozit, the damned poets, who far from being monsters of evil, dared to give loud and clear expression, expression to feelings that the most wretched among us had always shamefully repressed for fear of being swallowed alive. It's like giving voice to your wild side to uh, the morality had told you you were ashamed, what you were to be ashamed of actually became the center of your emancipation and your expression. Mm -hmm. Next slide. Yeah, so I think uh, one other uh, important element that we found is that in landscape and the representation of landscape in uh, Quebec painting, there's always people in the, in the representation in compared to a group of seven paintings. So, for us, it's a kind of a manifestation of what's important as well uh, in our practice, as well in, in Claude Cormier, of uh, you know the community and always thinking of the the uh, bringing people together in the public space and as a way to live the public space through people together. And there's a kind of austerity as well in this painting, which is a. Uh, quite nice, but we, we, we went away from that and trying to bring a, a joy, uh, especially in our work. I don't know if it's really present for all the, the landscape architects in Quebec, but us as a practice uh, is quite important. Oops. Yeah, and this is a project that we did at Pink Balls, which kind of bring this notion of uh, trying to infuse in the public space uh, not only an experience that could be appealing for everyone, that brings people, uh, that could speak to everyone, uh, in, instead of all the particularities or uh, specificity, specificity of the site. So that's an installation that is really rooted into the district, that speak to the district, but also offering an experience of, uh, uh, that goes beyond that, a kind of a phenomenon that can bring people together and people can relate to it, and through this, uh, through this design, uh, people engage each other. So it's, a, it's always that balance of finding, uh, pleasing the people individually, but always creating something to, so that people can uh, relate in a broader sense. And I think it could be uh, something that is kind of uh, unique to our work in Quebec, or could become something that you know, defines a, a, what could be a specific attitude in, uh, in Quebec design in the future. Yeah. There's one thing, just in closing, I want to bring um, Christopher Hume, who we all know is with the architecture critic at the uh, Toronto Star. He wrote an interesting piece after Sugar Beach opened for Metropolis. And um, I'm just going to read you this, because it's quite an interesting comparison. Um, this idea of emancipation, because I've uh, kind of emancipation one in, brings one in touch with their desire. And so I'm just going to read this to you quickly. With its cringe-worthy colonial history and muddy provincial past, Toronto is not a city accustomed to the sweet pleasures of inhabitable, inhabitable public space, and in this case, of incongruity. Now, its denizens bask in it. The tiny beach, which faces a huge sugar refinery, turns visitors into audience members in the theater of industry unfolding across the slip. In a city that has long taken pride in the paved indifference of its public realm, Sugar Beach is all the more remarkable. No benches on Toronto streets. They would only make us loiterers. Prettiness must also be distrusted, elegance eschewed. But Sugar Beach raises the stakes, replacing civic rectitude with hedonistic individualism. Little wonder Torontonians find it irresistible. It speaks of human desire. It knows the difference between what we want and what we think we should want. It's not there to make us better citizens or prove a point. It's rational as the logic of pleasure. It's neither good for you or bad. It exists just to be enjoyed. Thank you.
Well, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Alyssa, for inviting me to contribute to this amazing publication. My name is Matthew Spermuli. I am a research manager with Autodesk Research and a sessional lecturer here at U of T, uh, both in the landscape department and the architecture department. If you don't know me as <laughs> anywhere near landscape architecture, I don't blame you. I'm an architect by training, uh, love cross-disciplinary work and landscape architecture, and effectively brought an architectural mix to the sandwich of the three authors of this chapter 10. So uh, shout out to Fadi and Shadi, the uh, mixer of the sandwich. Uh, unable to be here, but very honored to contribute to the chapter. Um, I'm going to give you just a very brief sneak peek of what the chapter is. We are officially chapter 10. We kick off part three, which looks into a much deeper, broader, more complex question of how landscape architecture can be applied to bigger questions, bigger complexities, and bigger scale. And our particular chapter kicks that section off, I think, quite well as an anchor of a means. How can you do this with technology? So the overarching kind of like premise of the chapter is to essentially give um, an overview of how contemporary digital representation in landscape architecture is shaped by technology with a Canadian specific perspective. It's kind of a mouthful. Basically what we're trying to do is say, how has technology influenced landscape architecture, its visualization, and what cool stuff has Canada brought to the table? We did this by breaking the chapter up into three premise questions. The first is, where did we come from? The second is, where are we now? And the third is, where could we go? For the first subsection, where did we come from? Uh, the chapter is basically highlighting a very brief synopsis of two contemporary kind of epicenters that have contributed to technological innovation in landscape architecture. A distinctive creation period from the 70s to the 2000s, epicentered geographically here in Toronto with the Canadian Landscape um, Research Center, and the second as a critique period, starting in the 2000s, as geographically centered at the CALP in BC. I'm highlighting here, behind me you can see, some of the innovations that came out of the CLR. Um, both epicenters are demarcated by an activation of a local and somewhat regional um, ecosystem of contributors and players. In this case, the innovation that's born out of the CLR can be seen activating members from IMAX theater technologies, um, Alias Research, which is now Autodesk Research, um, and a variety of other small players in projection media able to bring forth what you're seeing here as how to actually bring the context and the subject of landscape architecture immediately and immersively close to an audience. Afterwards, more innovations were layered atop of this primary subject, um, adding in things like data and information, a kind of precursor to what we now call BIM or even landscape information modeling. The second uh, subsection of the chapter asks, you know, where are we now? And we did this uh, chapter as an, an, an initial survey of questions uh, across numerous, and in fact, all Canadian universities with a landscape architecture academic program. And we asked very forthcoming uh, questions about how technology is influencing or impacting curriculum and research and academic activities. What you're seeing here are highlights from 2015, a kind of snippet across a couple of advanced thesis projects from students here at University of Toronto. On the left, you're seeing an emphasis on how accessible 
mesh modeling tools have become for landscape architecture students to do advanced terrain modeling and analysis. And on the right, you're seeing some initial dips of toe into the world of associative or parametric modeling in order to look at performance metrics and different scenarios. Both of these technologies were being used to rapidly iterate and enhance the speed at which students could not only create, but then to then communicate their work to audiences or stakeholders. In the final subsection, we ask, where could we go? And in this one, at the time, we did um, a brief synopsis of different trends that we observed that were infiltrating the practice, uh, the discipline, and academia. And we saw a distinctive shy away from photorealistic renderings, which were becoming a bit of a fatigue across the discipline, and most notably in academia, where students were rejecting photorealism because it did not carry their personal authorship and interests the same way that a rendering, photorealistic rendering, might have. And so we see here a kind of blend of technology meets collage and drawing as a first step at the time towards making a distinctive impression of what landscape architecture representation could be. And I leave um, the chapter with a kind of question mark as we do in the chapter as well, which is we started with the question of what could representation look like? And I challenge everyone to think about how technology can not only influence representation, which is perhaps one of the you know, low hanging fruits that we might imagine technology impacting the discipline, but other modes of perhaps um, uh, uh, digital construction, robotic fabrication, or even remote sensing, um, internet of things, data collection. And I pull up this map as just a quick reminder of how close a local ecosystem of players could be. This is a five kilometer radius with U of T at the center and a number of players that could be activated to provoke questions of how technology could impact the discipline. So I encourage you to read more, uh, read more and thank you again for the opportunity to speak. Good evening. My name is Michael Ermson Holloway, and like most of us here, I think, I'm a landscape architect, but I'm also an ecological designer, I'm a soil scientist, and I'm a certified arborist. Beyond that, I'm a graduate of this faculty, and to connect things just a little bit more, Alyssa was my thesis advisor. Now, the reason I mention that is certainly not to date either of us, but rather to note that things that initially attracted us all to this discipline they don't diminish, and in fact, I am still telling versions of the same stories that I told in school, albeit hopefully wiser and more layered versions of them now. I targeted landscape <laughs> architecture because of a deep-seated and driving desire to more meaningfully green uh, cities. And I mean moving beyond green gestures, even the robustly verdant ones, and actually implementing projects infused with inherent attributes that build tangible ecological connections. And then embracing the complexity of them all, promoting scientific models of measured designs and subsequently establishing project targets and outcomes as a measure of success. But we know we can't always achieve this. Sometimes our clients just aren't interested in an approach like that. Other times the context is so densely urban that it's next to impossible to build an ecologically driven design model. And other times still our budgets are too low or project objectives are too onerous. That it's just a foolish way to direct our financial energy and resources. But I would argue that sometimes, and we collectively miss opportunities to make these connections when perhaps we could have or should have made them. I believe our responsibility as landscape architects has changed. There's more pressure now, there's a different pressure now, 
And beyond resiliency, I believe we must do everything we can toward achieving more sustainability as fundamental to our work. Without sounding too simple, or even alarming perhaps, and rather hoping more for motivating and catalyzing, our climate's changing, our sea levels are rising, and our water and air quality are suffering. Not sure about you, but these things increasingly keep me up at night. More than any other single discipline, it is landscape architecture, I believe, that is best positioned as a vehicle to tackle these issues. And while there may be better individual skill sets to deal with specific problem typologies, I would argue that no one is better suited to steering the collective effort than us. I was privileged to be the guest editor of the spring 2021 issue of Landscape Paysage entitled Trees. I brought together with the help of an incredible editorial board some of the best thinkers when it comes to landscape architectures and trees. We highlighted projects that I wrote about in this chapter, exemplifying water uh, recharging, bioamplification, species diversity, mature tree canopies, and then quite simply the idea of the right tree in the right place, something I say a lot. This issue triggered grant applications that are being ground tested right now with new approaches to landscape ecology and urban forestry. It's incredible what can come out of just one conversation with the right people. I've been privileged in my career to be able to promote ideas of ecological urgency and to be part of some of these discussions where we're looking toward the future with new design models and perhaps more importantly, shifted collective values. As some tangible examples of that, I am currently helping to design smart soils and super delivery systems to establish canopy trees on balconies on cold climate towers. This would have been absolutely unbelievable to me just 10 years ago. On another project, I'm working with KPMB and Henning Larson nestling a building into a forest on the UTM campus, extending building arms or branches into the weakest parts of that forest, resulting in a building that form that entirely responds to the health of that existing ecosystem. That story is beautiful enough, but beyond that, this project also incorporates hibernaculums, reptile crossings, bat habitat, breeding bird life cycle design, and ephemeral pools for amphibian reproduction. I rarely get to do one of those things on a project, let alone all of them in one place another sign of shifting collective values. And I will leave with this last example. Just this morning, I was part of a meeting with a shortlisted design team for Seneca's Health and Wellness Center, um, a design competition, where we promoted a successional design model with stratified soil profiles working entirely with the substrate that's already there, reinstalling it in biologically engineered lifts and burying biomass and locally sourced seeds that will be co collected from my tree nursery that tune into ELC life cycles. These weren't conversations I was having five years ago. So to be clear, this is all a bit like a dream. This is exactly why I do what I do, designing with nature, working together to redefine what urban environments can be, testing, establishing and promoting performance-driven models for ecological success. This is what gets me out of bed in the morning. And I've learned so much along the way and working with so many of you in this room today, as a matter of fact. So thank you. And Alyssa, I think I'm ready to write my second chapter. Thank you for listening and keep advocating. Thank you. the rest of Michael's slides. <laughs> Good evening, it's such a pleasure to be here. I am Sandra Cook, a landscape architect and co-founder of Brackish Design Studio based in Halifax and St. John, along with Matthew Brown, who you heard from earlier this evening. Um, when the early drafts of this chapter were written, I was working also, I was working as a project manager at Downsview Park in the north end of Toronto. Um, Downsview is one of the large parks that is discussed in this chapter, and it serves as an example of the many challenges and opportunities that present themselves in the planning and implementation of a large park in today's context. 
This chapter looks at large parks, both contemporary and historic, from the perspective of ecosystem integrity, resilience, and landscape as infrastructure. Now, landscape, the park as infrastructure is not a new idea. This concept was very much present in the thinking of early landscape architects like Olmsted, and was a driver behind the 19th century parks movement, born of the idea that green space provides a range of mental, physical, and environmental health benefits amid the increasingly dense early industrial city, not to mention the economic benefits that parks bring to cities. Most of the large urban parks that we're familiar with in Canada have existed as parks since the late 19th century, such as Stanley Park, pictured here, Mount Royal, High Park, and Point Pleasant Park in Halifax, to name a few. For the most part, these early parks were, largely wood, were sited on largely wooded areas at the urban periphery, and the act of establishing a large, uh, these sites as large parks was an act of preservation. Over time, roads, paths, and entrances were added to allow people access and uh, the ability to enjoy these landscapes. But the resulting fragmentation of, park land, of these park landscapes has been detrimental to their ecological integrity over time and to their ability to function as infrastructure. As these parks grew in popularity, they became catalysts for urbanization. Neighborhoods, transportation corridors, and commercial streets quickly sprang up around park edges, bringing more people to the parks, reducing connectivity to adjacent landscapes or water bodies, and further threatening the very ecosystems that made the parks attractive to visitors in the first place. Recent large parks, like Downsview Park, pictured here, have the opportunity to apply the lessons from, the, er, from those 19th century parks. In this case, the site was a former airfield and military base, and very little of the original pre-development landscape remained on the site by the time it was established as a public open space. Designing the park meant creating a new ecology from the ground up. But perhaps just as compelling was the opportunity to direct how the urban int intensification at the park edges plays out. The contemporary parks in this chapter are being planned in anticipation of and in concert with the neighborhoods that will ultimately surround them. Park designers are carefully considering the park's infrastructural roles and ecosystem services, for example, handling stormwater from those neighborhoods, or providing space for local food production. The parks are being designed as performative ecosystems that are as closely tied with urban processes as they are with natural ones. The new neighborhoods associated with these parks introduce the potential for increased education, volunteerism, and stewardship, which are promoted through programming and management plans. We're starting to see a reciprocal relationship forming between park and city, landscape, and people. Rouge National Urban Park, east of Toronto, pictured here, is promoting stewardship and citizen science as key program elements in an ongoing adaptive management strategy. And we're starting to see this shift in thinking also in the historic parks, with more and more emphasis on restoration and adaptive management. In High Park, as an example, prescribed burns, a management practice aimed at regenerating the park's black oak savanna ecosystem, have become an anticipated and celebrated event in the community, and this practice is now embedded in the park's identity. The chapter concludes that the historic and contemporary parks discussed are really headed on opposite trajectories towards a similar ecological state, one that needs to engage the, the human component of urban ecosystems into the design, programming, and management of the, lar of the large park landscape in order to ensure long-term success and resilience. Thank you. So I also authored a chapter in this book. <clears throat> Sorry, I knew I'd lose my voice tonight. Um, and this chapter <clears throat> is a whirlwind tour regarding theories about nature. It starts with the idea that landscape architects design nature and ends with thoughts on human level machine intelligence, better known as AI, to enforce that we and AI 
and everything in between are all nature. The chapter attempts to shift us away from the unhelpful binary dialectic so prevalent in landscape architecture of nature versus culture, art versus science, wilderness versus city, and so forth. It outlines the idea of operative landscapes, a term I've been defining as designed landscapes that are fully functioning and continually in effect. An operative landscape is designed through structuring frameworks that allow for the productive evolution of space over time. <clears throat> Under multi-headed topics that blur lines between binaries, I share the directions of other disciplines as well as projects of Canadian landscape architecture, such as the heading of health, social factors, psychology, phenomenology. In her East Three Schools landscape in Inuvik, our renowned Cornelia Han Oberlander has seamlessly joined creative play opportunities, salvaging and reusing vegetation mats that held the future seeds of birches and other bog plants. Inuvia Lewitt Elders' knowledge of relationships between people and plants, as well as seed collection and propagation, sensitive building siting, wind and snow modeling, tree sourcing from the local forests, pruning roots a year ahead in preparation of transplant to ensure survival, and food security were all addressed in her design. Under the heading of culture, economics, sociology, creativity, art, activism, culture, pop culture, global mainstream, and in search for the embodiment of these various knowledge streams within the practice of landscape architecture, CCXA comes to mind through this steadfast pursuit of clarity expressed as a singular, broad, culturally framed idea. Claude Cormier positions his project concepts by an intense mixing of the conflicting and entangled realities of a site. Under science, environment, systems, metrics, logics, and so forth, I write about legendary Canadian landscape architect Michael Huff, who stated, ecology is urbanization, and urbanization is ecology. As we well know, Huff dedicated his career to evolving the ideals between cities and nature. And borrowing from author Thomas Friedman in a section titled, Technology, or Towards a Flat Nature, I share my office, North Design Office's installation of integrated flexible solar panels into fabric coverings with illuminated internal LED sources with silhouetted irregular 3D modeled forms of bent CNC tubes. These were set among strips of prairie grasses chosen for their urban rooftop location, supporting a new ecology of plants, birds, insects, and humans on the site. The final segment titled Forest Technology Trees Talk outlines the impressive network qualities that already exist in nature. Furthermore, unlike other ancient cultures that flourished until their demise, Canada's First Nations, Métis, and Inuit populations have sustained life, water, and forest for thousands of years on this land. With Canada being the fastest growing country in the G7 and amid reconciliation to right the wrongs done to the Aboriginal pillar of our society, Canadian landscape architects have an innate responsibility to establish concepts that reflect contemporary nature and to ensure the endurance of the global forest, the land, and healthful life on it. <clears throat> nature is fascinating, complex, <clears throat> and resilient. The concept of nature embraces much more than its isolated sense of everything in the physical world not made by humans. Rather, it entails a comprehensive vision of nature which includes everything we do, make, and are. This is what landscape architects can work with and uphold, and what Canadian landscape architects are already that much closer to. Designing operative landscapes is a means towards this method. Landscape architects must remain cognizant of our lineage of thinking to comprehend what informs and drives our disciplinary theory, but most important, to critically inform the right direction towards a productive future. And Really, really quickly, <laughs> I'm gonna try um, and give an overview for the authors that aren't here. Um, and so they're basically, um, send their regrets. Uh, they couldn't be here in person as they're either on airplanes or in opposite time zones. So I'll use their chapters as a form of summary for the evening, and then we can open the floor to questions. <clears throat> In her chapter, Shelley Long covers the National Park as an integral part of the Canadian approach to the vastness of this country and its relatively intact nature. 
how current landscape practice is informed by this relationship in an ongoing struggle for balance of use, cultural history, and environmental protection. Susan Harrington looks at the idea of supernatural as an edited version of nature constructed to satisfy the demands of Canada's growing cities. Using the Vancouver Convention Center as an example, Harrington provokes the global imaginary that thinks all of Canada is a wilderness. Karen Wilson Baptiste provides a beautiful narrative of a phenomenological encounter with the Canadian prairie as she delves into how we might foster a new approach that builds accord with the landscapes that sustain us. And to return back to our locale, James Roche outlines how landscapes now form part of the city's infrastructure. With a focus on the current work being done on Toronto's waterfront, Roche argues for the unengineering of our typical gray infrastructures and demonstrates that Canadian landscape architects are at the forefront of the natural infrastructure movement. These and all the chapters speak to inherently Canadian topics, Canada's vastness, its perceived and wild nature, cultural histories so tied to the land which reach back to indigenous communities and their traditional knowledge that has sustained thousands of years of balanced life in some of the world's harshest climates. Deep and ingrained feelings for regional landscape idiosyncrasies that translate into cultural ones. World leading technologies, rapidly growing cities, landscape solutions that will support healthy and just living, and the qualities and importance of nature in Canada. The qualities of the nature in. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to open up the floor. Um, please feel welcome to pose questions to any of the attending authors since I've clearly left my, lost my voice. Hopefully it'll be to other authors. Um, and I guess we might have a few microphones here that, yeah, we can distribute accordingly. Don't be shy. <laughs> Questions? <laughs> yes, it is. It'll be for sale outside right now. We can all go. <laughs> all right, then. Thank you very, very much for your attention. Have a great evening.